I love Centaur World, guys. Of course I do. It's like my exact sense of humor. Engage your inner blinkies. Engaging, just give me a second. Faster, warm awake. Parts of the show aren't my cup of tea. Longtime subscribers may recall my hatred for bathroom humor, but the kids can have their tinkle tinkle bye bye zones and fart songs, and I can have my lore and my genocidal elk shrimp atrocity meow meow man. But you know, Wamawink takes the gold for me. The moment the cast lowered the bubble around their home, I went, oh boy, I hope there's a story behind Wamawink's overprotectiveness. Oh my. Anyway, so I feel like Centaur World set Wamawink and Horse up for this wonderfully complex arc about trauma and trust, and fulfilled that promise for one glorious season. Until season two hit like the world's most aimless freight train. Okay, that's not fair. Like I said, I love Centaur World. I admire the fuck out of the creators. I feel like they dropped the ball, and that's fine. Not everyone will like every element of a show, and I did not like the way the latter half of Centaur World handled Wamawink and Horse's arcs. So, here we are. What? I'm getting you out of here, second baby girl. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to explain what I didn't like about season two of Horse and Wamawink, I gotta rewind to what I loved about their early development. Horse is a warhorse. She lost both her parents at a young age and was raised to fight Minotaurs alongside her best friend Ryder. Wamawink also lost her parents at a young age, when her whole village was wiped out by a Minotaur raid. When Horse and Wamawink first meet, they function as polar opposites. Horse with her muted colors and sharp angles, Wamawink with her pink highlighter fluff, Horse with her penchants for violence, and Wamawink her conflict avoidance. The two butt heads from the get-go because, while Horse and Wamawink come from similar trauma, their coping mechanisms are fundamentally incompatible. The war has followed Horse her whole life. The one time we see Horse try to stop and retreat to safety, Ryder has no choice but to steer her on through the flames. Horse rushes headfirst into danger because that's the way she's been taught to survive. Stop and be ambushed. Run and live to fight another day. This perpetual motion has enabled, or maybe forced, Horse to outrun her trauma. Horse can't afford to stop long enough to process the sadness and fear, she and Ryder have to calm down and push through, on and on forever, for their safety as well as the betterment of their world. I want Horse and I to be together and to go as fast and as far as we can because we want to, not because we have to. Meanwhile, the war ended for Wamawink decades ago. There are enough safe places around Centaur World that, unlike Horse, Wamawink has a choice whether or not to engage with stressful or dangerous situations. <laughs> it's going to be wonderful! <laughs> are you sure they won't just walk away when it gets too hard? Ouch. She grabs her found family and hunkers down somewhere comfortable, forbids any mention of the war and never revisits places that remind her of her trauma, because that's how she's learned how to survive. Wamawink evades her trauma via stasis. Horse evades her trauma through constant action. Of course, these two are going to be at each other's throats. Horse hates to dawdle, not only because she needs to find Ryder, but also because the more time she's afforded to sit with herself, the more of her true self peeks out from the armored veneer. You know what would really cheer me up? Getting back to Ryder before the rest of me turns into talking cotton candy. Horse doesn't know how to quantify the parts of herself that are not directly useful to Ryder or the war effort. They make her feel scared and ashamed. You think I want Ryder to see me like this? No, Jade. What are your shoulder pads? <laughs> She'll think I've become some sort of clown. I also need to talk about Wamawink's mother hen status. In the aftermath of the death of all her friends and family, we watch Wamawink develop magic as a kind of leverage. If I can keep people safe, they won't leave me. Come back here. It's dangerous out there. I can keep you safe. I just have to practice a little more. She casts a protective bubble around the people she cares about, both to keep out the dangers of the world and to trap her loved ones within her orbit. Wamawink offers lost souls a place of refuge, then makes them dependent upon her for food and protection to the point where they can no longer function without her magic. My food actually comes from Ryder's hands, which means yours probably comes from... You should go find yourself some food, some actual food. No. Yes. No. I feel like Wamawink also uses her status as the mom friend to moralize her emotional repression. 
As an adult, you're supposed to foster a different relationship with your young children than you would with, you know, a close adult friend. To some degree, parents need to put on a brave face around young children to give them a chance to grow at their own pace. When Wamawink casts the herd as her young, helpless children, she not only absolves herself of the need to ever talk about her trauma, but almost necessitates her silence for the sake of her children's emotional well-being. The second Wamawink meets Horse, we see her reach for the poor small baby box as a reflex. And Horse flees. L like a baby! Not like a literal baby, hey, more like a baby in spirit. You know that weird-looking metaphorical baby that you were just talking about? Hmm, <laughs> yes? Well, she gone! Unlike the other members of Wamawink's party, Horse has been trained to kill from a young age. She may not know much about food, but her status as a ruthless warhorse defies Wamawink's helpless baby categorization. Horse's agency forces Wamawink to see her as an equal, which Wamawink perceives less as an opportunity for a mature, close friendship than a threat to her safe status quo. It's a joy to watch Wamawink and Horse's relationship progress to the point where Wamawink can finally realize the advantages of an adult friendship. For years and years, Wamawink has been solely responsible for the herd's safety. She's assigned herself this role of constant hypervigilance, where she can't afford to look away for even a second lest the world steal away her family again. Then there's this wonderful moment where Wamawink, exhausted from the trip to her childhood home, accepts Horse's offer to shoulder that burden of motherhood for a while. She's finally allowed to take off the responsible adult hat and rest. My hooves feel like they're made of million-pound rocks. Then let me lighten your burden, baby girl. <laughs> Once they're able to find common ground, Wamawink and Horse forge a close bond. The term baby girl wasn't always exclusive to Horse, but once Horse adopts the term, baby girl very much becomes a Horse Wamawink thing. Baby girl, you awake? Are you talking to me? Yeah, baby girl. Don't call me that, call me Horse. Oh, our baby girl's growing up. Is that what that was? A spell? Cross my heart, baby girl. Thank you for everything you've done for me, but especially you. It was nothing, baby girl. Horse, baby girl. Ah! Oh, we need a rope bridge to get across. On it, baby girl. <laughs> Let it out, baby girl. Um, hey, baby girl. <gasps> baby girl. There's no time. We gotta get this baby girl through the rift. Only I call her that. It's kind of great because the term baby girl contains a wide variety of connotations. It's a term you might ascribe to a small child, which harkens back to Wamawink's attempts to label Horse as another helpless baby. Or one may use the term baby girl to describe a close friend, even a romantic partner. Frank Nussel argues the baby names allow both people a certain freedom from the normal constraints of adult roles. Horse gives Wamawink the chance to shuck her mother hen roll and take a nap. In turn, Wamawink and her herd provide a safe space for Horse to peel off her war armor and wail and whinge like a child. Horse and Wamawink can sort of trade off as the designated responsible adult of the party. We see the way Horse and Wamawink's partnership grants them the security they lacked as children, the security they need to rest and grow and recover from the trauma they've endured. The herd benefits from this relationship too. Wamawink and Horse's dual approaches to leadership balance each other out. Horse encourages the herd to explore dangerous new situations, while Wamawink provides protection and comfort when things go awry. Under their direction, the herd are finally allowed to grow out of that government-assigned toddler role and find their way. But back to Horse and Wamawink's dynamic. There's this really dark moment where Horse decides she's too far gone. She sees her transformation not as a mark of her recovery, but as a betrayal to Ryder, and she... She, she kind of sort of commits suicide. You have to keep going. You are not alone in this. And a warrior from a different world can find love so far from home. The phrase, find love so far from home, only adds to the ambiguity of Wamawink and Horse's relationship. By the end of season one, Horse and Wamawink care deeply for one another, but the exact nature of their relationship escapes definition. Is Wamawink still too hung up on her paternal role to accept Horace as an equal for more than a few scenes at a time? Are they on the path towards a, a 
Romantic partnership? Here comes the alert. Megan said platonic? Oh, honey, I don't think they're lesbians. In squad! No, no, I'll call you. That's fine. I can... I can put away my ship feels. It's meant to be familial. Um, it's supposed to be a relationship that starts where she is trying to mother a horse, but then it goes into something else. It's, it, it is, it is so, um, I mean, there is something of a love story there. It, it's not meant to be romantic. Wamawink and horse's arcs didn't necessitate a romantic union. Regardless, I was very curious to see how Horse and Wama Wink's partnership would evolve as the show went on, the stakes got higher, and the characters were pushed to their limits. Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. When you start off with a sunshine character and a stormy character, there's an enormous amount of room for character growth. But by the midway mark of Centaur World, the sunshine and the storm have all but found middle ground. There's still work to be done, but Wama Wink has confronted the stormy parts of her past, and Horse has come to accept some of the more sunny, silly parts of herself, has learned how to be vulnerable around others. After Wama Wink rescues Horse from the whale tar, Horse looks like she's ready to move forward as her new, real self. Her world has expanded enough that she's even able to step away from Ryder. Wama Wink has grown enough to let someone she loves walk out of her life. So, what's the next step for those arcs? Well, Centaur World decided to double down on the question of roles. You and I are so very similar. When the Nowhere King says that he and Horse are alike, I think he partly means they defy categorization. They are neither human nor centaur nor non-magical animal. This could be taken to mean they belong nowhere, as the Nowhere King claims, or perhaps that they belong anywhere, wherever they choose as Horse may or may not learn by the end of the show. At first, Horse aims to fill the role of an army recruiter, a bridge between the worlds. However, we see her plans fall through over and over and over and over. It's always another member of the team who seals the deal on a new band of allies, not Horse. At least she has her role as Ryder's horse, up until Ryder gets a new horse. Horse appears to be utterly replaceable, unable to secure any one unique role. She longs to find a niche that only she can fill, but as the season goes on, she comes to fear such a role does not exist. As a reminder, the Nowhere King reacted to the sense of rejection and estrangement with unethical experiments and violence, which escalated to a war with himself that nearly wiped out humanity. Becky Apples is undermining my relationship with Ryder. I mean, what's the point? <laughs> Everyone betrays you anyway, even if you're fighting for them. War is probably a good thing, yeah? So you can take up all your pens and stuff and let it all out some mentors. I don't know about you guys, but I expected Horse to turn around and realize that she didn't need a designated role to belong somewhere. Maybe she needed to change her outlook and ask not why her friends needed her, but what they valued about her. Her drive, her ambition, her kindness, her dark side, her sense of humor. Or maybe, what does Horse value about her friends? Maybe Horse belongs with both the herd and with Ryder, not because she's their designated warhorse or recruiter, but because she's their friend, because they make each other better, because both the herd and Ryder mean the world to Horse and she means the world to them. We don't, we don't really, the, the, sh the show doesn't really do that. <laughs> Horse's conflict is resolved in two parts. Horse confesses her insecurities to Wama Wink several times over the course of season two. The last time she brings up her fears, she subsequently discovers her affinity for backstory magic, which irreparably diverts the conversation. Upon the discovery that every member of the herd has suffered, Horse remarks, I've been selfish. I, I was throwing a pity party for myself. But now I've seen that we've all been through stuff. And she never brings up her concerns about her place ever again. <laughs> I'm the one with the problem, not you. Get over it. Okay. So I have no problem with the lesson, I'm not the center of the universe, and I should remember that everyone's been through stuff. But how does that lesson relate to Horse's arc? It's like we get this whole buildup about how Horse feels replaceable and placeless, and that's put to rest with a moral that comes across less like, my friends and I have all been through shit and that means I'm not alone, and more like, well, everyone's got trauma so I should shut up and get over myself. Like, who cares whether I agree with that statement on a personal level? 
on a story level, does this lesson about perspective pose a cohesive conclusion to Horse's arc? Does this lesson answer the season-wide question, how do I cope when I feel like I don't belong anywhere? I want to say no, at least not all the way. This moral pushes aside the question of roles rather than provide a solid answer, which feels at odds with the pattern set up by the rest of the story. Up until this point, Centaur World has been very vocal about the fact that a lot of the time, to heal from trauma, you have to confront the things that scare you. In this scene, Horse doesn't face her problem so much as say, you've all been through some shit so my problem doesn't matter, and the problem vanishes. If Horse has any residual hang-ups about her place in the world, she sure as hell doesn't voice them. We're meant to assume she's fine now, which… <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong, Horse has struggled with perspective. For so much of her life, Horse has only had to worry about herself and Ryder. It takes practice for her to remember to care about other people. We see her go tunnel vision mode to the point that she becomes oblivious to, or worse, apathetic towards, the struggles of her other friends. So I guess this moral has a place within Centaur World as a story. In the first season, we see Horse take some major strides towards like this wider radius of compassion. And I guess there was room to grow. But I still found the question, where do I belong, to be the more central conflict of season two. And I don't like how the crew positioned, I need to be more conscious of others, as its resolution. The creators have paired a payoff with the wrong setup. In the end, Horse gets to travel between the worlds, with both her herd and Ryder by her side. Horse has figured out she belongs with the people she loves. I only wish there'd been a more concrete bridge between her long, I'm useless and I don't belong anywhere conflict, and this moment, where Horse seems totally content with herself and her place. I'm happy with where Horse ends up, but where Horse ends up feels… unearned. I belong with Ryder! I belong with my herd! I belong with my friends! What happened? Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. And then there's Wamawink, whose arc... Did her arc even get a conclusion, or...? <laughs> she probably wants to be all rested before she meets her actual best friend. This must really suck for you! Throughout season two, Horse struggles to understand where she fits within the world at large. Wamawink doesn't know where she fits next to Horse. It's just that... <sighs> where do we go from here? Side note, do you and Ryder have a futon? Because I will need it. Are they best friends for fancy frolicking? Or are they only acquaintances bound by circumstance? Could Horse ever care about Wamawink the way she cares about Ryder? Obviously, I could never replace Ryder as your BFF, your closest confidant. <laughs> True. <laughs> it's a sad situation because while Horse has Wamawink and Ryder, Wamawink kind of only has Horse. As we've discussed, Wamawink shares a mother-child relationship with the rest of the herd. Horse and Water Baby are her only adult relationships, and we rarely see Water Baby spend time with Wamawink outside of battle. Horse is the only person Wamawink trusts enough to relax around, to hand over the reins to the life she's built with her family. Horse is the only person who knows about what she's been through. And Horse spends a lot of season two regretting her decision to stay with Wamawink. Wamawink wants to believe she's enough for Horse. We see her fish for some kind of validation over and over, only to be shut down. I guess I thought it was my job to rally the troops, you know? It's the reason I didn't go back with Ryder. Well, you still have an important role to play here in Centaur World. <laughs> but also, there are probably other reasons you'd stay, right? Right? Out of friends? Certain? Friends? Specific? Friends, maybe? <laughs> uh, me? Me, maybe? Wamawink? In their performance for the Bird Tars, Wamawink plays the role of Ryder. This scene may or may not bring Wamawink's worst fears to life, where she will only ever amount to a Ryder placeholder. Regardless, Wamawink throws herself into the role of a discount Ryder, but Horse doesn't take well to the stage, and her responses to Wamawink's declarations are stilted and uncomfortable. 
and all I want to do is hold you close again. The bird tar play, as well as the bird tar's general distaste for Womowink and horse's passive remarks, plant the seeds for an arc about jealousy and insecurity. You'd kind of expect this conflict to, like, come to a head at some point. Nope, wrong again. <laughs> When I first watched season two, I figured there was a lesson on the horizon about how you can't replicate the bond your friend shares with someone else, and that's kind of the point. You're a different person, and you bring different but equally valuable traits to the friendship table. You are special to your friend for reasons unique to you. Wink and Horse's bond is different from Horse and Rider's, but no less valuable. When Horse finds out that Rider has taken on another warhorse, she panics and presumes she's lost her place as Ryder's best friend. A diss track ensues, where Horse rails against Becky Apples, Wamawink against Jeffica. Then we get this line. Jeffica, making me feel bad about projecting my own insecurities and displacing blame on her when she really did nothing wrong? Ugh, she's the worst. <laughs> ah, yes, let's explore that projection. Centaur World deals a lot with codependency and obsession. We're all different, but we're always together. We're splendid. We're kind of codependent, but we're happier this way. The Nowhere King provides the more toxic example, as someone who would rather burn down the world than go to therapy. She might have loved us the way we were. We didn't even try. Hmm. The Nowhere King fights his eternal battle out of hatred for himself, but he uses the woman he loves as a catalyst for his actions. I, I know I know how this looks. But I, I had to do it so I could live to see you, so I could tell you that I love you. The Nowhere King depends on the woman for validation. Horse depends on Ryder for validation. Becky poses a threat to Horse's role as Ryder's warhorse, kind of like Horse posed a threat to Wamawink's role as the designated adult. Those fears of being replaced, that Horse and Wamawink's authentic selves aren't good enough for the people they care about are coming from a place of deeply rooted insecurity within Horse and Wamawink. These characters have the choice to project that insecurity onto whoever they've labeled a challenger. Wamawink can continue to compare herself to Jeffica and Ryder, and Horse can continue to compare herself to Becky. Or they can take the more difficult path and do some self-reflection. They can trace their jealousy back to that very real childhood fear of abandonment. I'd lost my father to the war. I'd lost my mother to the war. And this was my only friend left in the world. Maybe Horse's problem isn't Becky Apples, and maybe Wamawink's problem isn't Ryder or Jeffica. Maybe Horse and Wamawink's problem is that their past trauma is clouding their perception of the present. Maybe the problem is Horse and Wamawink's belief that the love from their families is conditional upon their ability to provide a specific function. How do you deal with those kinds of problems? Well, you could start a world war, for one. Maybe you could keep an eye on your thought patterns and take steps to recognize when your trauma sets off a, yeah, 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 maybe that's too nuanced. Okay, new take. Maybe you could widen your social circle. That's a good step. Wama Wink could open up to Water Baby in the herd, widen her options for adult companionship so she doesn't have to lean so hard on horse. Maybe she could talk to Jeffica, Maybe Horse could open up to Becky. Or... Becky Apples. So that's the last time Horse ever talks about Becky Apples. We're introduced to what could be a juicy piece of conflict, only for that conflict to be swept aside. And as for Wamawink, well, the show kind of skips to this line. Wamawink, our worlds are connected now. We'll see each other all the time. The last time Wamawink fished for validation from Horse, Horse didn't even notice. What's changed between the two since then? I guess we're supposed to look back on Horse's backstory magic scene and be like, oh, Horse had to look outside her pain enough to recognize that Wamawink needed support. But what about Wamawink's arc? From this line, we can glean she's figured out that she, Horse, and Ryder can all be best friends. <laughs> Just three best friends for fancy frolicking, traveling between worlds, going on adventures together. How'd you figure this out? The You're My Family line harkens back to the start of the season, where Horse calls Wama Wink her closest family, but only as a sad parody of an exchange with Ryder. For, for you are my closest family.
by the end of the show, Horse has come to accept both Wink and Ryder as her family. Somehow, and Wink accepts both Horse and Ryder as her baby girls, which... I don't understand. <laughs> Why do you suddenly feel this way? I don't understand. Like, I can point to specific moments throughout season one and declare, there, that's where Horse decided to support Wamawink. That's where Wamawink decided to trust Horse. That's where Horse found the will to push on despite the pain. Wamawink and Horse change a lot over the course of the first season, and you can trace the cause and effect of each change. These moments of growth are like landmarks for us to chart along a path to resolution. The arcs of season two are so much harder to pin down. Now, at this point, you may be like, Rab, calm the fuck down. It's a, it's, it's a kid show. Face me this way, take a call. Centaur World had no obligation to be anything more than jangling keys for seven hours. But from day one, creator Megan Nicole Dong was like, I want to go hard on this. She told Animation World Network, The characters have flaws, and a lot of those come from implied trauma that they have gone through. So, I hope that people notice themes of healing and community and relate to that too. And I feel like... For one season, Nicole Dong and her crew did a fantastic job telling a complex story about trauma and community, and they did that not despite, but via a fun fantastical romp. Now, I, I wouldn't call the first season perfect, but I was so surprised and delighted by the depth on display here. Centaur World Season 1 took some very dark, complex problems and made them relatable to children and adults alike. I was psyched to see where Season 2 would take these character relationships. And then we got a rushed season that planted seeds of conflict and didn't nurture them to maturity so much as proclaim them oak trees. The second season came across as shallow and confused to me. I lost all sense of progression. I could no longer make sense of when or why characters like Wamawink and Horse learned pivotal life lessons. When that chain of cause and effect breaks down, a narrative can start to feel plastic. Look, I love Horse and Wamawink. You can tell. Megan Nicole Dong made clear that for the second season, she wanted to spend more time with the rest of the herd. Of course, I'm not going to be as ecstatic over season two as I was for season one with the lens turned away from my faves. But then why do I feel like even the herd got snubbed? Derpleton and Stabby got the most fleshed out arcs. I love how Derpleton spent so much of his childhood starved of attention that, when presented with a child of his own, he overcompensates. Like Wamawink, he coddles Stabby to the point that he robs him of agency. The two have to work out a balance that suits their dynamic, one that allows them to heal in tandem with each other. You ever set out to make a character dynamic based on a Dungeons and Dragons gag and then accidentally make a metaphor about non-sexual age play? I have unquantifiable corpses on my conscience. <sighs> cup, cup, data? I'm 43 years old. But what about Glendale? Was she supposed to learn how to cope with her anxiety? When did she develop the tools she shared with the cold tars? Like you're all... Uh, projecting? That's right. And what are you projecting? Projecting, projecting our, our inability, inability to control the unpredictable brutality of nature by answering the violence perpetrated on our psyches by externalizing violence onto other centaurs around us. We see her reach for a paper bag, maybe once. Maybe Glendale had to learn how to accept herself for who she was, eldritch kleptomania and all. But did we see one of those arcs play out, or were we sort of told an arc had occurred? Meanwhile, Zulius bases his self-worth on the awe and envy of others. We see him break down when the team visits the Cat Tars because the loss of the Tea Time trophy was such a lethal blow to his confidence. I'm kind of surprised we didn't see him take steps to alter that mindset, because he pairs up with Splendib out of nowhere. Get up, oh, yeah! And I would have assumed, you know, that Zulius could only foster that kind of relationship once he'd learned to share the spotlight. Which, I don't know. 
did Zulius learn to do that? At some point? He was more receptive to the herd when the bird tire play crashed and burned than he was when Horace needed his help before Johnny Tea Time's Be Best competition. So, Ched goes back and forth over how he feels about Horace. By the end of the show, they're friends, but... I mean, um, yeah, yeah, and he, he has that, that moment at the end where, you know, his, his, his arc gets resolved, I guess, because he, he took, he, he played, he did the thing, and I don't know, guys, I'm so tired. I'm so glad we tied up that story arc. We spend so much of the season on Why won't you let me die? and tertiary characters like Comfortable Doug on a quest that feels oddly hazy. Remember Wamawink's backstory reveal? It hit like a cannonball to the gut because the creators let the scenes deep. I wasn't swept along through the flames to the next story beat. I was given the space to process and mourn alongside Wamawink and Horse. In a season that was supposedly about the rest of the herd, their backstories were so starkly compressed by comparison. I don't understand why they weren't spaced out across the whole season so that the audience could digest each new reveal. Zulius's backstory would have required too much screen time, so we didn't even get to see his past at all. These backstories are central to each cast member's story, but are almost treated like an afterthought to the recruitment plot. This point made me ask myself, why are character arcs important? And I guess they don't need to be. I think whether your character would benefit from an arc depends on the type of story you want to tell. Maybe you only want to make goofs and gags. Maybe your characters don't change, and that's the point. I think character arcs are simply another tool at a writer's disposal. Conflict and change are intrinsic to storytelling, so the addition or omission of character arcs can make a big difference towards the message of your work. Also, no, I checked, and at the moment there are no plans for a third season or a film, so... That's my event about Centaur World, because I feel like this season wasn't as balanced between gags and character work, and that's kind of a problem when your whole theme is about balance. Okay, bye. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, hey, yes, squad. Thank you to all my wonderful patrons who make these videos possible. Special shout out to my top patrons, shown here as Bird Tars. Achutha Ananda, Amy Holschwander, Benji, Ken B. Coy, Council of Geeks, Dane, James Andrew Brown, Miranda, Anna Doodles, Acute Latios, and Jayette. You guys are the magic that keeps this houseboat afloat. See ya, sinners! <laughs>